I've been out of academia for about a year now, but I really did enjoy my time in grad school. Granted, I know that that's not a universally shared opinion by people that have been to grad school. Grad school, at least when you're getting your doctorate, isn't really normal school as most people think of it. You're, it's basically a job. You're getting paid to do scientific research and depending on your program, occasionally teach. The most common question that you get asked when you're in college is, how are classes going? But if you're pursuing a doctorate, you really don't take very many classes. There's like a core sequence of classes the first year, and then you basically only take classes after that that are immediately relevant to the projects that you're working on. And most people don't take any classes for the last couple of years. The vast majority of your time is instead spent doing research in the lab, you know, running experiments and writing scientific papers. In a rather overly philosophical sense, Every piece of published scientific research basically adds a teeny tiny little bit of information to the accumulated pile of knowledge that we as a species have amassed since we started writing things down. That's like the stated reason for scientific papers. Now, when you pursue a PhD, you're basically dedicating four to six years studying the same topic, the same set of questions and really trying to drill down into something novel. You end up accumulating all of your findings into one big document called a dissertation. This is mine. It has 185 pages in total, 72 figures, and 196 references to previously published work, which makes it sound like an absolute monster. But honestly, after years of experiments, not everything even makes it into here. At the end of all of this, you defend your dissertation. You give a talk to a public audience, including your committee members and your professor, who evaluate your body of work, and if they deem it satisfactory, they award you a doctorate. Then your professor comes out, shakes your hand, calls you doctor, and everybody's happy. Also, there's normally a party. Now, normally, PhD defenses are held in a lecture hall on campus somewhere to a large audience. But because I graduated during COVID restrictions, I actually defended over Zoom to a live studio audience of friends and family. The upshot of this is that now I have a recording of the whole thing. Since I started featuring stuff from the lab on the channel a few years ago, I've gotten a lot of comments asking what the research is, what I do, what, you know, happens in grad school. So I figured that I would share my defense as sort of a prepackaged summary of the stuff that we do in the lab. Although a PhD defense is supposed to be and is very much a Cliff Notes version of all of the work that you have done over a few years. Obviously, you can't pack years worth of work into a 45 minute lecture. This video is still not going to be for everybody. PhD defenses are notoriously dense. I mean, PhD research in general is so specific that if you just launch into the detail, there's gonna be a small handful of people anywhere that can keep up with everything you're saying. That's the problem with doing something, you know, that is by definition new. <laughs> because of this, I personally enjoy watching the defenses that are intentionally geared towards a more general audience and sort of ramp where they, you know, start with something that anybody interested in science should be able to understand and then by the end, maybe that's the information for the committee that nobody's gonna understand. So. Uh, trying to hit that balance is what I attempted to do when I designed my slides. I guess releasing it on YouTube now, we'll see how successful I was in that. But without any more editing booth monologue, I'll roll the recording. I hope you enjoy it. So I think over the next, you know, 40 minutes, I want to just, you know, let Brian tell you all the wonderful, you know, deep, insightful work that he's done in sort of characterizing semiconductors in our group. And Brian, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today. So over the last few years, I have been working with Kunal and specifically on this project with Eamon Hughes on growth of a very interesting infrared material called lead selenide. And like Kunal said, since I was the first student in the group, a lot of this was really sort of getting on our feet and learning how these materials behave and growing lots of crystals, looking at the defects in those crystals and trying to make them better. Uh, so I have found it all very interesting, and I hope that after this talk that you do too. Now, a defense like this is sort of weird. On the, on the spectrum of talks from like a really highly technical group meeting presentation to a department seminar to 
you know, general outreach, they sort of span the gamut. So I'm going to try to give the committee all the detail that they want, and I'm also going to try to make it interesting uh, for everybody else. So if I mess that up in either direction, you know, let me know, and uh, I'll have, uh, I'll be able to answer questions at the end. So that said, I want to start at the very beginning and say that we grow crystals. That basically means that we take a precursor material or a source material that has all of the atoms in it that we want, in this case, lead one, selenium one molecules, and we sort and arrange those into a regular structure, an ordered lattice. In this case, it is the rock salt crystal structure, and this is what rock salt lead selenide actually looks like. So the problem is that we don't actually have any control over this process at all. The atoms have to form this structure by themselves. All we can do is sort of put them there and hope that they do. <laughs> uh, atoms are, in this, this is a simulation of actually a different structure forming, but it gets the point across that only local interactions, like in this case, red atoms and red atoms repel and red atoms and blue atoms attract. And based on simple rules, they will build very complicated symmetric structures. And in this case, uh, by the end, it actually forms this very nice structure with you know, flat edges, and you can see that all the atoms have sorted themselves into nice rows. So this is very much a crystal structure. But inorganic crystal growth is really then an effort to determine what conditions we can expose our precursor material to to encourage it to arrange itself into an ordered lattice. And then the technical challenge of actually recreating those conditions reliably in, in a lab so that we can grow material that we want. And to do that, we use a molecular beam epitaxy system. So this is uh, the three of us, uh, me in the background, Kunal and Eamon, standing over the Rebear 46 MBE, uh, smiling. So we weren't always smiling when we were standing over the system. Uh, there were, you know, we, we saw this from the very beginning, unloading it from a truck and, uh, and put the whole thing together. And it was a lot of fun, lots of stuff to learn about. But MBEs, if you haven't seen one before, look really scary and daunting. And that's because they've got, you know, all these extra moving parts and they've got cables and hoses and tubes and whatnot. But the vast majority of the system is just dedicated to pumping. Uh, this is an ultra high vacuum technique, so we have absolutely nothing inside of this chamber except the material that we want to be there. So for the purposes of understanding an MBE talk, you can ignore all of the pumping and you really just need to care about what's happening in the growth chamber. So in the growth chamber, we have our substrate and we have our source material that we want to apply to that substrate. Uh, at the top here, uh, you know, behind the metal, if you could x-ray through it, you'd see something that looks like this. Uh, we have this tiny little uh, one centimeter square here of gallium arsenide, and that is actually our seed crystal that we want to build on top of. And we have it heated from the back by this heater that comes down from the top, and the crystal is sort of upside down at the top of the system. And then at the bottom, we have our sources. So these are all known as effusion cells. There's two of them, and these are some empty slots. And this is what one of those looks like when it's pulled out of the system. And it's basically a tiny little heater that will generate lead selenide molecules and then expel them from the end of the heater. And in the geometry of the system, it expels them up into the substrate and continues growing the crystal. So for this reason, sort of the classic metaphor of MBE is that you're spray painting with atoms and that you've got you know, a whole bunch of different effusion cells at the bottom with different materials in them. And by controlling the proportions of those materials and the temperature of the substrate, you can encourage a particular crystal structure to grow. So that's sort of the, the five minute overview of, of uh, MBE and inorganic crystal growth. So now I wanna to talk to you about lead selenide. Why are we putting so much effort into growing this particular uh, crystal structure? I want to start by talking about semiconductors in general then, because one of the most important parameters for a semiconducting material is the band gap of the material. And the band gap is basically the amount of energy that an electron gains or loses when the material absorbs or emits light. And that means that the band gap of the material really sets where the material is going to be useful as an optoelectronic. So if you want to make something like uh, visible light. So say you want to make an LED light bulb, the nitrides and things like gallium nitride with very wide band gaps are a good choice. 
For near-infrared materials, things like telecom lasers that you know shoot uh, infrared down fiber optic cables, things like gallium arsenides, the 3-5 materials uh, with sort of mid-range band gaps. And if you want to go farther into the infrared, you sort of start to run out of options because there aren't that many materials with very narrow band gaps. But the 4-6 materials, lead selenide included, are one of those options. And one of the most interesting applications of materials in the mid-infrared is actually spectroscopy. So once you get that far into the infrared spectrum, you're dealing with very small energies, and you're outside the realm of electronic transitions in most materials. And you actually start seeing molecular vibrational modes, which means that every molecule is going to have a very particular absorption line, and you can basically pick a composition of a 4-6 material, tune it to a very specific wavelength, and then detect uh, various gases with various characteristic absorption uh, for you know, any health or industrial application that you may want. This is actually the only uh, current commercial use of the 4-6 materials. They're actually used for chemical sensing and things like thermal imaging. And the surprising thing is that these are done with polycrystalline films. So we believe that to make very efficient light emitters, we're going to need very high quality material. But one really encouraging thing is that very low quality material can actually produce very useful devices. So all of these commercialized products are not MBE grown, ultra high purity, ultra high quality crystals, uh, but they still function when they're full of defects. And that has sort of given these materials a reputation as a defect tolerant family of semiconductors. Now, <laughs> defect tolerance is something that's sort of hard to classify and there are a few materials that exhibit things like this, but one of the reasons that we think that the 4-6 materials are defect tolerant materials uh, is because they have a very peculiar bonding arrangement. We really normally like to put materials into bins of ionic bonding or covalent bonding or um, metallic bonding, but the 4-6s are sort of a mix of all of these. Some people term it metavalent bonding, uh, depending on who you ask, but it's, it's distinct. So here I have uh, a bunch of different material properties that are important for semiconductors uh, plotted against band gap. And you can see that as the band gap goes down, oops, you can see that as the band gap goes down, the electron effective mass and the Auger recombination uh, trend strongly with band gap among covalently bonded semiconductors like silicon or gallium arsenide or zinc selenide. And when you add the four sixes to this plot, you see that they diverge from these trends completely. So uh, lead selenide and lead telluride here have much higher electron effective masses, much lower Auger recombination, and very much higher static dielectric constants. And we're hoping that this combination of properties is going to lead uh, to efficient and defect tolerant optoelectronic devices that operate in the mid-infrared. The difficulty is that this peculiar bonding that gives them favorable electronic properties also makes them very difficult to incorporate on foreign substrates. So if you want to grow a crystal, ideally you start with that same crystal. <laughs> and uh, in this case, we've got like a chunk of lead selenide here and you, you know, throw lead selenide precursor molecules at it and they'll just add to this and they'll build the crystal and that's known as homoepitaxy. But there are a number of reasons that we don't want to do this with the 4-6 materials. Uh, first and foremost, lead selenide is not mass produced as a, as a freestanding crystal. So the substrates are very small and very expensive. They are also very mechanically weak to the point where if you pick up one of these substrates with a pair of tweezers, uh, you'll like fill it with defects. So we kind of want to stay away from these. And for that reason, the vast majority of the work on 4-6 growth historically has actually been heteroepitaxy, where we're growing one material on a completely different crystal structure. And the classic material for the 4-6s is actually this family of fluorite materials, uh, notably barium fluorite. And this system is characterized by very weak bonding. The film doesn't stick to the substrate very well, uh, which can sometimes make the growth difficult to control. But these substrates themselves are actually water soluble. So typically you do something like cleave this and then immediately load the cleaved substrate into the MBE so that uh, it can be under vacuum before atmospheric moisture has time to start degrading it. So we really didn't want to use these substrates either. And instead, we have explored growing the rock salt 
four six materials on the three five zinc blend materials. So this is yet another crystal structure. But the three five materials are really an established and commercialized semiconductor platform in their own right. And we want to basically be able to leverage all of this institutional knowledge about how to grow 3.5 materials and use it as a platform on which to grow our 4.6 materials, which we think are very interesting but still need a lot more work. The challenge now is that we need to actually be able to form an interface between these two crystals. We need to be able to grow rock salt on zinc blend. And there's, I've already mentioned that there's a change in bonding between these two. We go from the mixed bonding to covalent bonding. There's a change in lattice parameter. So despite both of these being uh, cubic crystal structures, the size of those cubes are actually different and that can cause problems. There's gonna be a surface charge buildup at this interface. And there's a change in coordination from a tetrahedrally bonded material to an octahedrally bonded material, which basically means that you're gonna have at least one layer of atoms at this interface that is bonded to way too many things or way too few things. And it's going to be a very high energy configuration. So we need to fix all these problems. And uh, that brings me to my first real results section on synthesizing heterovalent interfaces. So uh, this was sort of what we did first, was try to gain control of this process before we tried to actually work on the film quality itself. This is an example of a very early one uh, that did not work very well. So this is a cross-section looking at a misoriented lead selenide nucleus on top of a defect in a gallium antimonide substrate. Uh, so this is like a whole bunch of things wrong. I'm going to show you some that worked well in, in just a minute. But I want to introduce probably the best tool that we have for directly imaging these interfaces and figuring out what's going on. And that is the STEM, the Scanning Transmission Electron Microscope. So this is the Talos, this is the STEM that I have used for all of the imaging that you're going to see today. And uh, it's about the size of a small car. This is what it looks like on the inside. It's just a big block of stainless steel because it's also a vacuum process just like the MBE. But basically a STEM uh, it generates an electron beam and then with a big series of coils focuses that electron beam down to a subatomic point and then you can raster that beam back and forth across a very thin sample and everywhere that that beam hits an atom it'll scatter and everywhere that that beam doesn't hit an atom uh, it'll go straight through and you can use that to literally map out interfaces and figure out where all the atoms are. What makes this difficult is that the samples themselves need to be really really small. So uh, for reference, this is my hand, which is holding a pair of tweezers, which is holding this tiny little piece of copper foil. And if we zoom in on that piece of copper foil, we see uh, that it has all these little tines on the top. So if we zoom in on those tines, we see that one of those has a bump on it. And if we zoom in on that bump, we will see this very, very thin flake of material. And this is actually a cross-sectional sample that I have extracted from a uh, lead selenide on gallium arsenide film. And this sample is only about 50 nanometers thick, which means that if we load this into the stem, we can shoot electrons straight through it and actually map out where all of the atoms are at this interface. So this is lead selenide on gallium arsenide. And you can see where all of the atoms are. Uh, notably, this pattern is completely different than this pattern because this is a zinc blend material and this is a rock salt material. And the most interesting things are happening at the interface right here. This is actually a very wide uh, dislocation that I will talk more about, I think, literally on the last slide of this talk. Now, to look at a, a slightly simpler interface, uh, this is the first one that we really did a lot of characterization on, looking at lead selenide on indium arsenide. And I have two pictures here because basically these are two orthogonal cross sections through the material. And then if you image through both of them, you can sort of back project and you can figure out where all of the atoms are at the interface. And it's like doing tomography with only two pictures. And when you do that, you generate a structure like this. This is an actual, uh, the actual registry between lead selenide and indium arsenide in the stable interfaces that we've been able to form. And I want to talk more about this interface in a minute, but I sort of wanted to show this slide as a teaser because this is, this is sort of the best that we get in terms of being able to analyze this interface. But I want to back up and show you where we started because at the beginning, we had no idea what these interfaces look like and we were struggling to even form them. So generally when you do heteropotaxial crystal growth or even any crystal growth, the substrate is supposed to guide the material that is landing on it and arrange into a crystal structure that aligns with the substrate. So the film that's growing should inherit symmetry from the substrate. 
And unfortunately, the interfacial energy between lead selenide and, for example, gallium antimonide is so high that these films that are forming don't inherit symmetry from the substrate properly. They'll nucleate chunks of lead selenide, but it'll be tilted or rotated in some weird way, which means that when they all coalesce, we don't have one single film anymore. We have basically a bunch of different crystals that are stuck together, which is not what we want. So our best tool to address this is actually read or reflection high energy electron diffraction. Uh, anyone that has ever grown MBE will, <laughs> if you prompt them, complain endlessly about having stared at blinking dot patterns like this on a screen for a very long time. Uh, because this is actually an in-situ technique. So during growth of a material, you can do diffraction and observe the periodicity of the surface in real time, which is actually an incredibly powerful technique. And it lets us see what's going on in these crystals. So if we had lead selenide nucleating in a cube-on-cube -cube orientation on gallium antimonide, we would expect to see a pattern where all of these green dots uh, we, would, we would expect to see spots where I have marked all of these green dots here. Uh, we sort of see a dot right there, and we sort of see a dot right there. So there might be a little bit of material that looks like this, but the vast majority of it is not. And uh, it takes a while of staring at this diagram to figure out that it's actually just spun 90 degrees. And what was actually happening when we tried to grow lead selenide below 300 C is that we would have it rotating 90 degrees and we would have chunks of lead selenide that were misnucleating on the surface. When we grow hotter, when we grow above like 340 C, we have a completely different pattern and rotating at 90 degrees doesn't work anymore. Uh, thankfully, it's actually still rotating about the same axis. So we can take it another 20 degrees and then another 20 degrees the other way. And uh, we see that we have a mix of 221 grains and 221 bar grains, and actually some of the cubic as well. So you may look at this and say, well, this is when it's too hot and this is when it's too cold. Maybe there's a Goldilocks temperature where you'll only get this one. And unfortunately, the answer is that at a Goldilocks temperature like 320, you actually get all four of these nucleating at the same time. So we needed to be slightly more clever uh, in how we address this problem. But like I said, in MBE, you really only have control of the atoms that are being launched towards the substrate and the temperature of the substrate. So we don't have that many knobs to turn. Thankfully, the sequencing of all of this is actually uh, very powerful. And if you do things in just the right order, you can gain a lot of control over the interface. So what we have been doing is taking the samples to 330 degrees, turning on lead selenide flux, and we find lots of spots in reed. So some of that material is basically getting stuck in a tilted configuration. And it would be really nice if we could grow this material hotter so that it would, be, it would have more thermal energy and it would be able to bounce around and find a more equilibrium position. Uh, but unfortunately, if we try to grow lead selenide above about 360 degrees, the lead selenide evaporation rate off the substrate is greater than the deposition rate. So we don't actually grow any material. Uh, but that didn't stop us from trying. So when we try to grow lead selenide at 400 degrees, uh, we find that the atoms, the molecules that are hitting the surface, do have the thermal energy to bounce around and find a stable configuration on the surface. Uh, we can see very nice patterns in reed that show up, but we can only grow a single monolayer of material because while lead selenide will stick to the substrate at 400 degrees, lead selenide will not stick to itself at 400 degrees. So we can grow one layer, and now we sort of look at this as a surface treatment or a surface dosing procedure, where we build this template at high temperature, and then we cool the material back down and grow on this template, and then we have single orientation growth. And instead of all of these spots in reed, we have a very nice streaky periodic pattern. So this is what we wanted to see. Uh, now, I want to look back at these pictures of the interface and say what we really think is going on during this dosing procedure and what's important about how we can actually grow these crystals. So first, I want to mention that this registry between uh, the rock salt material and the zinc blend material is known as the chain arsenic structure. And we believe that we actually have bonded the top layer of arsenic in the indium arsenide to the bottom layer of lead in the lead cell. I'm sorry, to the bottom layer of lead selenide. So uh, we think this, first of all, because indium arsenide is a very strongly tetrahedrally bonded material. And 
these arsenic atoms, you can see this one is bonding up to those two indiums, so this one's going to want to bond up to those two leads. But more than that, we actually see a distortion at the interface where the selenium in the first couple layers is displaced up. It's actually pushed away from the interface where the lead atoms are not. So it looks like because of the interfacial surface charge that we actually trap between these two materials, the more electronegative selenium atoms are literally pushed away uh, and the lead atoms are the ones that are doing the, the meat of the bonding. Now, uh, from the perspective of trying to form this interface, that means that lead is really important. So lead being basically the, the primary bonder between these two very distinct materials, when we try to do the surface dose with lead selenide flux, it works great. But if we try to do the surface dose only using selenium flux, it doesn't work. Uh, it's very inconsistent. Sometimes we get things that may be single nucleated, but most of the time uh, we would still get misoriented grains. And this really you know, tells why. So, we know that lead is important to, to, uh, to forming this interface, and if you deposit a layer of selenium first, then the lead is basically going to have to burrow through that to make the bonds on the surface that it needs to, and that's not going to be an energetically favorable thing to do. So I think that uh, it's really satisfying to be able to see something empirically at a large scale with you know, diffraction-based techniques, and then to zoom in and really understand the bonding uh, in a way that leads us towards a more robust growth of these materials. So. Once we figured out how to nucleate these films, uh, we needed to actually make the films better. So in terms of like actual crystalline quality, just getting them all to point the same way is, uh, is very different. So at the beginning, like this is growth number 14, this hardly even looks like a, like a film. It's just, you know, we sort of sprayed material at the substrate and it's stuck. Uh, we need to do better than this. For a while, we had a long series of samples that I referred to as the waffles. Uh, because they had these really shallow square surface pits and they legitimately made me hungry while I was doing microscopy on them. Uh, and after a while, we eventually figured out once we you know, had this surface dosing down and like oriented grains would coalesce much more evenly, we eventually got smooth surfaces and then learned how to fill in these pits so that we could get uh, very nice films with very nice interfaces and very nice surfaces. And if you look at these in x-ray, we can actually get nice thickness fringes which speak to the quality of the interfaces and surfaces. Now, these are not uh, very high quality films though by any stretch. We have good interfaces and good surfaces, but they're still full of crystalline defects. And uh, just, you know, for kicks, we decided to send some of these materials off to a collaborator at UT Austin who could actually measure the uh, light that was emitted from these materials. And even some of our very early samples, our highly defective samples, uh, emitted light strongly. And this was surprising, but I mentioned at the beginning that these are supposed to be defect tolerant materials. Um, so I don't know, maybe it shouldn't have been surprising, but uh, we have uh, in, in this plot here, two samples of lead selenide grown on gallium arsenide with something like 10 to the 9 dislocations per square centimeter, which would render the vast majority of semiconductors electronically and optically dead. Uh, and next to it, we have emitting almost exactly the same amount of light. I mean, we normally plot this on a log scale, so effectively these are all the same peak, uh, of indium arsenide, which is an infrared 3.5 material uh, with three orders of magnitude fewer dislocations. This has something like 10 to the 6 dislocations per square centimeter. So we're emitting the same amount of light at a longer wavelength uh, with three orders of magnitude more dislocations, which is pretty phenomenal. Uh, and based on uh, time-resolved photoluminescence, uh, some of these films have had uh, lifetimes in, well, this one had a lifetime of about 20 nanoseconds. Uh, some of them have been in hundreds, and this is surprising, but we actually still think that some of these films are Shockley Reed Hall limited, which means that if we make this number go down, uh, that these lifetimes are going to get longer and the film's going to get even brighter. So I am very hopeful for the future uh, to see some of these results on very high quality films and see just how good we can make them. Now, on the last slide I mentioned dislocations as a particular type of crystalline defect that we wanted to address. And because dislocations are such a ubiquitous defect, they're actually very well understood in other more conventional materials like the three fives. So I want to take a, a detour here and talk about some of the work that I did my first year here before we were growing four sixes 
uh, looking at dislocations in gallium arsenide films grown on silicon uh, in hopes that dislocations in more conventional materials can give us insight into how dislocations will behave in our more exotic uh, rock salt films. So my favorite way to explain dislocations to people is basically to draw a box like this except it's not really a square. One side has one fewer set of dots and then you fill this in and if you fill this in by hand, the human brain does a fantastic job of making everything over here look really nice and square and everything over here look really nice and square and everything over here looks really nice and square. But when you get to the middle, the structure breaks down. Uh, th there's absolutely no way to make this pattern look regular. You end up with this weird trapezoid in the center. And that's because you've basically injected an extra half a column of dots into your material. And uh, this itself, this core, is the dislocation. Of course, we can look at this in a real material as well. Uh, this is a high resolution stem micrograph of a lead selenide film, and in it we have a dislocation. And if you trace around that dislocation, uh, you'll find that your trace or Burger's, or, uh, Burger's circuit does not actually close, which means that we have an extra half plane of atoms, in this case extending down through the bottom of the image. Uh, also in lead selenide here, the, I've got extra annotations because the core structure is a little more complicated, but in general, all of the crystal all the way around this material is perfect and it only the crystal is broken the pattern doesn't work anymore only at the center and I also refer to this as an extra half plane of atoms because it's important to remember that this is a three-dimensional structure so the actual broken part of the crystal is this blue line so we refer to dislocations as line defects now dislocations are important in materials because they are the, the carriers of plastic deformation. They allow materials to shear. Uh, and in this case, if we take this dislocation and we sort of shove it off the edge of this film, we can make the whole crystal look perfect by slightly shifting all of these atoms, but then we end up with the surface step. So by moving this dislocation, we have sheared the material. And if you apply a shear stress to a material, you can get dislocations to move. And then once those dislocations move, uh, that's how the material actually deforms. So what does all of this have to do with gallium arsenide on silicon? Uh, gallium arsenide is, although I've been talking about using the 3.5 materials as substrates for our 4.6 materials, uh, it is in its own right a very useful infrared semiconductor. And uh, here at UCSB, we've done a lot of work with uh, John Bauer's group uh, who is working on um, telecom lasers, being able to make infrared uh, lasers that can uh, work on fiber optic cables. People want to grow gallium arsenide on silicon substrates, frankly because silicon substrates are really cheap and they're everywhere. So if you can grow a good device on a cheap substrate, uh, you're doing a good thing. The problem is that now you have another one of these heteropotaxial combinations. So we've got one crystal and they're trying to grow it on a completely different crystal. And there are a number of problems at this interface, but the one that I want to discuss is actually a problem, a change in thermal coefficient of expansion. So if you've ever seen like a bimetallic strip from like an old thermostat or toaster or something like that, it's basically two pieces of metal with different thermal coefficients of expansion that are welded together. And when you heat it up or cool it down, that metal will actually bend one way or the other because one of those pieces is trying to expand more than the other one. And the exact same thing happens in semiconductor films when we grow a film at many hundreds of degrees Celsius and then cool it down to room temperature where we would actually use an electronic device. Now, in, gallium arsenide, in the gallium arsenide on, on silicon system, uh, both of these materials are going to contract when you cool them down from growth temperature. Uh, the silicon is going to contract, but the gallium arsenide actually has a significantly larger thermal coefficient of expansion, which means that it wants to contract more than the substrate that it's bonded to will let it, which means that the gallium arsenide is actually feeling a significant tensile stress and it's being pulled apart by the substrate. Now, because the gallium arsenide film is full of dislocations and dislocations can mediate stress in the material, uh, those dislocations can move around and relieve that thermal mismatch strain, literally resizing the gallium arsenide crystal. And this is exactly what we imaged uh, my first year here. So these are all, all of these spots and lines moving around are actually dislocations in a gallium arsenide film that is relaxing thermal mismatch strain on a silicon substrate. And 
it's great fun to take these time lapses and watch these defects move around because it really gives you an idea for what's going on in the crystal. Uh, one of the things that you want to note is that all of these dislocations are actually only moving in particular directions. That'll be important in a few slides. But uh, we did a lot of work looking at these defects, looking at dislocation velocities, and trying to measure activation energies and things like that. But more than just watching dislocations move around and interact with the film and substrate, we actually got to see dislocations interact with each other. And probably my favorite piece of microscopy that I've done uh, in grad school, well, so probably ever, uh, is watching the uh, two dislocations annihilate. So these are two dislocations in one of those gallium arsenide films. And you can see they have opposite contrast in the imaging condition that I'm using here, which basically means that there's two half planes point in opposite directions. And when these two dislocations run into each other, those two half planes just become one regular plane and the dislocations don't, don't exist. So if I play this video, you can see that those two approach each other and then just pop out of existence. And uh, if you make a whole bunch of screen grabs, it looks like that. So the ability to uh, actually observe reactions between dislocations, I mean, people have known that this has happened for a long time. People design films and growths in order to get dislocations to interact, but it's really great to be able to just see it happen right in front of you. Uh, so basically we were hoping that all of the stuff that we learned about 3-5 materials and how dislocations behaved in those materials, we could bring back to the realm of 4-6s and we could apply this to lead selenide and the mechanical behavior of lead selenide. Because as it turns out, we have the exact same problem. When we have lead selenide growing on an indium arsenide substrate, that indium arsenide substrate wants to contract when cooled but the lead selenide has an even higher thermal coefficient of expansion. So when the indium arsenide film cools down, the lead selenide film wants to uh, shrink even more and it feels a really significant tensile stress. We know that these lead selenide films are absolutely filled with dislocations, but unfortunately those dislocations don't move, which means that we get cracks in the film. The substrate literally rips the film apart when it cools down and you get surfaces that look like this. So this is an Amersky micrograph and you can see cracks spider webbing across the surface of one of these films. Uh, clearly something that you want to avoid when you're trying to grow you know, useful material. So earlier I said that lead selenide was so soft that picking it up with tweezers would cause it to deform. And you may look at this and say, well, no, this looks really brittle. That's completely the opposite, what gives. And the difference is geometry. Uh, the forces felt by lead selenide that is strained on an indium arsenide film or an indium arsenide substrate like this are very particular and they're in very specific directions. And unfortunately, dislocations only move in very specific directions. And in this case, the dislocations don't move in the direction that would relieve the stress. So in an ideal world, uh, dislocations would move in such a way that you would have shear in a material on a tilted plane. So if you had two pieces of lead selenide and they sort of sheared sideways, you could get the lead selenide to be longer and extend to match a larger indium arsenide substrate. But unfortunately, the actual slip system in lead selenide looks like this. It's, uh, it glides on the O1, O planes, and the best you can do with that is take part of your lead selenide film and sort of shift it up and down, uh, which clearly doesn't help in making the film longer. So lead selenide that is oriented in the OO1 direction feels no resolved shear uh, for in-plane strain, which means that you cannot rely on dislocations to make the film relax. Now, instead of trying to do something very complicated and get dislocations to move in directions that they don't normally, uh, we just decided to rotate the whole crystal. And then we could get our inclined glide planes. So uh, we have been growing basically on the top surface of the cube. So we, everything is uh, square looking symmetry, although on the 3-5 substrates it's actually two-fold rotationally symmetric, not four, but still. Uh, and instead, we then started to grow on the 1-1-1 plane. So if you take a cubic structure and you lop off a corner, uh, everything starts looking like triangles and hexagons. Uh, because if you look down the corner of a cube, it actually has three-fold rotational symmetry, believe it or not. Uh, I was surprised when I heard that, but if you like hold a cube in your hand, you can convince yourself of that. But uh, uh, that allows us to basically tilt all of these glide planes.
and we're just growing on a new surface. However, that means we're growing on a new surface and we have to solve all of these problems of nucleation over again. Now, when we don't control the nucleation properly, uh, all of our islands look like these triangles that point in opposite directions. And if we have uncontrolled growth, we have you know, nanoscale grains that are gonna be really horrible for a material. In an amazing stroke of luck, our surface treatment actually still works. So if we take a 111 oriented film, despite the fact that it has different symmetry, different symmetry, different chemistry, uh, different surface charge, all of those things, if we take it up to 400 degrees and we shoot lead selenide flux at it, we generate a template, cool that material back down and start growing lead selenide on it again, uh, we can get single orientation growth. And there's a lot of stuff about this interface that I'd like to have time to talk about, but I unfortunately do not in this talk today. But we did a lot of similar analysis looking at distortions at the interface and looking at how hard these materials are to grow. But what I really want to talk about with the one one oriented lead selenide is what dislocations do in this material. So we are very far from the first people to grow lead selenide in the one 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 orientation. I would say that most lead selenide that's been grown has actually been in the one 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 orientation. Uh, this is a paper from 1997 where they were looking at lead selenide that was grown on a calcium, calcium fluoride buffer layer on silicon and they were looking at how the material would relax. And they're saying these are all the inclined glide planes that point at angles in different directions. And if you can shear in all of these directions, the material will be able to relax. Uh, and you will also have um, a triangular grid of dislocations that's created at the interface between the lead selenide and the calcium fluoride. Well now, uh, that we know how to grow lead selenide in the one-on-one -on -one orientation on 3-5 substrates, and we have microscopy that is <laughs> many years newer, uh, we can literally go in and we can observe a triangular grid of misfit dislocations forming at the interface between lead selenide and indium arsenide. And I think that this is unbelievably satisfying to be able to see an old diagram like that from a paper and then just to be able to go take a picture of it. <laughs> so uh, if you look at it in cross section, you can see those dislocations uh, between the lead selenide and the indium arsenide, but they're not quite as impressive as when you can see the whole actual structure out in plan view like this. But more than just being an interesting symmetric pattern, uh, these dislocations are actually serving a very important purpose in the material. They're allowing it to deform. And we can measure this using photoluminescence. So if we have uh, a, a chunk of a semiconductor material and we cool that material down, it's going to shrink. And when it changes in size, it also changes in the wavelength of light that it emits. And in the case of lead selenide, it's actually opposite most semiconductors. So if we go from a very hot sample to a very cold sample, uh, you can see the photon energy is dropping here. It's getting red shifted as we cool it down. And if you plot this out here, you can see that the band gap is basically dropping with temperature. And these red dots are the data that are pulled from these curves. And we know what lead selenide should look like when we cool it down. If you have like a solid chunk of lead selenide and you cool it down, it's gonna follow this green line. But we also can calculate what lead selenide would look like if it was strained. So if the lead selenide was not relaxing on the substrate and the substrate was tugging on it and applying a significant in-plane strain to the material, we would be seeing these, this line of dots following the blue lines or the purple lines, and they don't which means that we actually have dislocations moving and relaxing this film all the way down to you know, 80 or 100 Kelvin, which is surprising because in the vast majority of semiconductors, dislocations don't move when the material is cold. So if you look at something like gallium arsenide, if you've got it below three or 400 degrees Celsius, all the dislocation motion is frozen out and they become very brittle materials. But in this case, they're plastically deforming at cryogenic temperatures, which is pretty impressive. So from the perspective of you know, applying this and trying to make useful devices, this basically means that we can take all of our knowledge from the 3.5 system of materials about how dislocations work. And when we grow on one -on one oriented substrates where all these dislocations move around, we can actually apply that knowledge. And more so, we can apply that knowledge at very reasonable temperatures. So where you would need to thermally cycle a material like gallium arsenide between room temperature and very high temperatures, you can actually cycle lead selenide between room temperature and very low temperatures and still get dislocations to move around and hit each other and annihilate. Uh, 
such that you reduce the dislocation density in the film. So it was actually on my list to take this very sample of lead selenide and uh, put it in a microscope and heat it up and cool it down and watch these defects move around to see if we could observe the same sorts of interactions. Uh, unfortunately, I did not actually have time to do that uh, before wrapping up, but I'm looking forward to the results of that experiment whenever it happens, and uh, I think this will be a very interesting thread to follow in the development of 4.6 devices. Now, that was the end of sort of the... New, the understood published research. And I want to say that there are still, from a structural perspective, a lot of things that we don't fully understand about these materials. And recently, uh, without the ability to grow new samples, uh, I have been doing a lot of characterization trying to solve some of these problems. And I want to talk to you about one of them here today. So, like, I don't know, 10 slides ago, I said that lead selenide could only shear on the O1O O planes. So you could only take an O1, an, I'm sorry, it would only shear on the, yeah, the O1O o planes. So if you took a 100 oriented film and you basically could only shift up and down, you couldn't shear sideways to relieve strain. Uh, however, that doesn't seem to always hold. <laughs> so uh, in one very interesting set of experiments, uh, these are all lead selenide films that I grew on metamorphic indium arsenide and timonide buffer layers. So it's still lead selenide on a 3.5 surface but now we have the ability to control the strain state of the film while it's growing. And in particular, these two films, uh, R278 and R279, were both nearly lattice matched to lead selenide. The, the unit cell was almost the exact same size. And, but one of them was slightly compressively strained, one of them was slightly tensile strained. And we see starkly different dislocation behavior in these two films. One of them seems to allow for secondary slip on the O1O o planes, which is an inclined plane, and one of them seems to allow for secondary or tertiary slip, depending on who you cite, uh, on the 111 planes, which is uh, very rare in these materials. Uh, but what's even weirder about 279 here is that all the dislocations seem to point in one direction. For lead selenide, which is a four-fold rotationally symmetric material, we would expect that anything that shows up in this direction should also show up in this direction, uh, but it doesn't. And I think that this really has to do with the, uh, the core chemistry in these dislocations. So in two-fold rotationally symmetric materials, like the zinc blend 3.5s, it has been known for a long time that dislocations that are oriented one way and dislocations that are oriented the other way behave completely differently. But these dislocations are being formed at an interface between a four-fold material and a two-fold material. And apparently, they still themselves are two-fold. I guess you go with the lowest symmetry. Now this, I don't have time to fully explain this diagram, but this is basically a moiré pattern that's formed between the lead selenide, the bottom layer of lead selenide, you can see I have all the lead and selenium atoms marked out here with the unit cell, and then the top layer of gallium arsenide, which is basically just arsenic, but the bonds point in a particular way, so it matters. And as you overlay these two materials, uh, you basically get a variety of registries between these two materials. So the chain lead arsenic stacking is the one that I showed a while ago in the 3D reconstruction. And this we believe to be the energetically favorable interface to form between these two materials. But if you have a dislocation in this material, uh, say you have a dislocation running in the 110 direction, the core of that dislocation is actually going to have this shadow lead arsenic stacking. And if you have a dislocation running in the other direction, it's going to have this shadow selenium arsenic stacking. So uh, the, the registry of these materials actually seems to be very important in determining which of these dislocations likes to form first. And in this case, it looks like uh, the shadow lead arsenic making dislocations in the 110 direction is actually more favorable. Now, to get away from this you know, big pattern of dots, uh, we can actually just see that this registry changes at the interface between lead selenide and gallium arsenide. So this is the, the example stem picture that I used on one of the first slides. And you can see that right here, the lead atoms are directly above the arsenic atoms, and they're lining up perfectly. So this is a, uh, basically as we're looking through a very thick film here, uh, chain lead arsenic stacking and shadow lead arsenic stacking. But over here, we have 
lead, arsenic, lead, arsenic, zigzagging. So these are actually the shadow selenium arsenic or chain selenium arsenic structures. And the most interesting thing about this picture is that where the selenium and arsenic are forced to interact with each other, the film actually bows away from the substrate. Like it really doesn't want these two atoms to be close together, uh, which is starting to feel sort of very convergent because I said that at the beginning, uh, when we started to look at distortions at these interfaces in indium arsenide, that all the selenium atoms were sort of pushed away from the interface, and they really didn't, you know, enjoy being there because of all the charge that we were trapping. And I think that uh, this starting to line up with those early measurements, uh, it, it feels like we're getting very close to really understanding what's going on at these interfaces, and I think that's going to be really cool. So. Uh, now I want to very briefly go over, you know, what we have done with lead selenide and what there is left to do. There is a lot left to do. <laughs> In this work, uh, I think that the most important thing was achieving single orientation nucleation of lead selenide on three, five surfaces in two different crystalline orientations. Uh, specifically by emphasizing the importance of surface chemistry over lattice mismatch in these films. Lattice mismatch is what most heteropotaxial systems are dependent on, but here we really need to get that surface dose. We really need to make sure that all our terminations are perfect to make this happen. We've also done a lot of work looking at how dislocations behave in these materials. They relax very nicely on 111 oriented films, but in 01 oriented films, uh, it's, it's more perplexing. <laughs> we generate a lot of defects during coalescence of this material, and then looking at how those defects behave, how defects that are pre-injected into the material behave, uh, are, are all uh, very interesting questions that we have at least dented <laughs> over the last few years. And I think that these dislocation studies have actually led to a path towards coherent growth of OO1-oriented lead selenide. I think we can grow it without any misfit dislocations at the interface, uh, but we haven't had the chance to actually try it yet since reanalyzing all of this data and hopefully figuring out what's actually going on. I do think that uh, in C2 relaxation experiments where you basically take the film and heat it up and cool it down while it's in the microscope uh, will be excellent to learn about how defects can move around in these materials and interact. But now that we're sort of reaching a, a time when we can stably grow these materials, we really need to start looking into electronic measurements and optical measurements to learn how electronic carriers behave in these materials and what recombination looks like in these materials. Uh, and assuming that all of those things go well, uh, hopefully using nonpolar substrates, trying to extend everything that we've learned about how to nucleate these materials uh, onto new substrates that you know, might be even easier to use, like germanium and silicon. And especially the surface dose on a nonpolar surface, I think, will be very interesting. So aside from all of the growth and the electron microscopy that quite literally happens in a vacuum, uh, getting a PhD does not happen in a vacuum. So I have an awful lot of people that I need to thank. Uh, first of all, thank you to everybody that is here today. Unfortunately, this is what you look like to me right now. Uh, it's a camera on a stick with some cables sticking off of it. But uh, I actually think that being able to do this remote has allowed me to share today, which I've been waiting for for a very long time, uh, with even more people. So that's been great, and I'm glad that everybody is here. With that, I will take any questions. <laughs> and if anybody is still watching at this point, wow, you are more likely than not very interested in material science. Awesome. I'll be answering as many questions as I can in the comments below, but if you really want to learn more about crystal growth and the specific techniques and equipment that we use to grow and characterize these samples, I have what I'm hoping is an undergraduate level summary uh, in chapter one and two of my dissertation, which will also be linked below. So if you're real curious, check that out. If you're curious about anything, leave a comment and I'll try to answer your questions. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.